On behalf of the Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art, I want to welcome you to a conversation on museums, healing, and transformation. This program is part of a series called Religion and Spirituality in the Museums and is generously supported by the Lilly Foundation Religion and Cultural Institutions Initiative. During today's live program, we are offering real-time captioning. To view the simulcast containing these services, please use the link provided in the comments section. If you are viewing the program after the live broadcast, please note that it will also be available on the museum's website and will feature closed captioning. My name is Sabrina Lynn Motley. I'm the director of the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, which has been produced since 1967 by the Center for Folklife and Cultural Heritage. I wanna thank my museum colleagues for including me in this timely and much needed conversation. Like them, issues of faith, religion, and ritual have been integral to our work. In this moment of COVID-19 and our reckoning with systemic racism, we too are asking questions about the possibility of our work to heal, to understand, and to transform. Today's discussion is an opportunity to learn from and with them and you. I encourage you to put your comments and chats in the chat section, as well as any questions you might have. To ground us, we begin with excerpts from a conversation I had with the Smithsonian's 14th secretary, Dr. Lonnie Bunch. We talked about his vision for the Smithsonian, his hopes for this country, and the power of museums to connect us during difficult times. Thank you for making time to share a few of your thoughts about the role of cultural institutions in fostering connection and transformation. Um, I should say that the conversation I had planned for us to have was itself transformed uh, in part by the recent passing of Congressman John Lewis. I know that he's someone that you knew well and was instrumental in the creation of the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Um, this weekend, I spent a lot of time rereading his book, Across That Bridge, A Vision for Change and the Future of America. And he writes, quote, when we follow the path of light, we co-align with the most dynamic forces of the universe, and we become greater than the sum of its parts. And it made me think of some of your own recent comments at uh, a museum, uh, American Association of Museums, you said, Quote, I've lived my whole career banging on the doors of museums, asking them to do better. Can you talk a little bit about what doing better looks like? In many ways, I think museums have a real interesting moment to define how they're of value. In one way, the traditional work we do, good exhibitions, building collections, that's really valuable. But I think we need to do much more. Mm -hmm. At a time when a nation is in crisis, Museums need to be the glue that holds a nation together. And to be that glue, they've got to be able to talk candidly about the past. They've got to be able to give the public tools to live their lives. Then we need to help people find understanding, help people find clarity. And if we can help people find understanding and clarity, then there's a chance we can find help people mm. find hope. Mm. And if we can do that, what a contribution we make as a, as a, as a culture. Part of the coming together that museums do um, is physical. And we know that in this moment of COVID, um, one of your concerns certainly must be how you reopen the museums in a way that people are safe, both the staff and our visitors are safe. I'm a museum baby. So mm -hmm. I love that getting up close to a work of art, to a performance, to a story. Um, can you talk a little bit about the ways in which you are safeguarding that experience as well as thinking about keeping people safe physically and safe in their own health. Well, there's no doubt that this is challenging us to find what is the new norm, right? Mm -hmm. Is for me, just like you, museums have always that special place that bring people together who don't know each other, 
mm-hmm. who rally around a piece of art or an exhibition or go to a public program. And suddenly you realize that will social distancing, will the fear of the virus prevent us from doing that? So it means we've got to think about it in, in several ways. First of all, we've got to think about how do you do all the protocols to keep everyone safe? So as we think about reopening the Smithsonian, we're doing everything from thinking about um, how do we make sure the staff answers questions every night, how they're feeling, so we can make sure that people stay home if they're not if they're not feeling well. How do we make sure that we inc- require people to wear masks, um, to do the basic social distancing that will make us be more healthy? I think it also means, though, that we have to think more creatively about um, can the digital, can the virtual fill some of that void? I don't think it can fill all of it because there is something special about listening to the person next to you talk about an object or tell a story where you suddenly realize that's my story too. So part of it is trying to figure out how do we create that virtual intimacy. My goal is to find the right tension, the right tension between traditional and digital. I think it's a mistake to suddenly say everything has to be digital. But I think that what we want to do is think about it in way, a much more integrated approach, rather than this is the museum, this is digital, to think about how do we come together and put those forces together and utilize them both to give the best visitor experience possible. Can you share a transformational moment that you've had in one of your museums? I've heard you speak about several, and I'm going to put you on the spot, but if you can just share one. Um, where you felt the museum was doing the good work, it was being better? Well, as you know, in the Museum of African American History and Culture, one of the things that it means a lot to me was the display where we exhibit Emmett Till's casket, the Mm -hmm. young boy who was brutally killed in 1955, whose mother was a friend of mine in Chicago. Um, And I would periodically go into that space just to sort of feel the power of Emmett Till's mother, right? Uh, um, And so once I was in the space, and it was early, so there weren't too many people around, and there was a youngish African-American woman, probably in her 30s, and she is crying when it comes to this. I mean, just crying around Emmett Till. And then all of a sudden, there was an elderly white man who came up to her and said, I share your pain. Can we cry together? And they held each other and cried. People that wouldn't know each other, wouldn't have anything in common, and they found their common humanity. They found a way to cross a line to help them each grapple with their pain. And in some ways, the museum at that moment always reminded me that at our best, we not only bring people together, we can help people find healing. Thank you, Dr. Bunch. Now, it's my great pleasure to welcome our panelist. Chase Robinson is the Dame Julian Sackler Director of the National Museum of Asian Art. A scholar of Islamic history and culture, he has authored or edited nine books and more than 40 articles that span the geographical and chronological breadth of pre and early modern Islamic Middle East. Dr. Robinson joined the museum in 2018. It's a pleasure to welcome you. And I think we're gonna bring you up. There you are. It's great to see you. Thank you for having me. Krista Tippett is the founder and CEO of the On Being Project, an award-winning journalist and best-selling author. She received a Master's of Divinity from Yale University. She's also been a teacher to so many of us. She's opened doors to new ways of thinking, given us the gift of questioning long held assumptions and encouraged us to look within as a necessary step to connecting beyond. Through her podcast, writing and live talks, she is without question one of the most visible, generous and treasured thinkers on religion and faith. Krista, it's my great pleasure to welcome you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to ask you the question that I asked uh, Secretary Bunch. Um, 
I want to ask you both to share briefly a moment of healing, a connection, transformation that you've had in the museum. Um, it doesn't have to be a Smithsonian, uh, but of course that's always a bonus, um, or with a work of art. And Krista, because you are the Smithsonian's guest, I'm going to ask you to go first. You know, I have to say, I always have trouble with the one moment question. <laughs> I also want to say how happy, how delighted I am to be here. I, I don't know, I don't, this, yeah. What's coming to mind for me is the time I spent in Cold War, Germany. And this is probably not the answer you expected, but I had an experience in East Germany uh, before the wall came down of, I remember going to the, um, to museums in, 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 in museum East Germany, which, which simply did not tell the story of the Holocaust. It turned it into a story about fascists versus capitalists, mm. uh, fascists versus communists. Mm. And um, I've never been so angry as I was after I went through that museum and actually wrote a postcard to the director, which would have been the state, knowing that it would probably never be read. And then how healing it was for me years later to finally see the Holocaust Museum or exhibit in West, in United Germany, which allowed the fullness of the story, which has no answers and no way to um, explain, but how that allowed you to take in the enormity and magnitude of the experience, both at a historical and a human level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chase. So um, I, I'm going to take liberties and give you two. And the reason I'll give you two um, is in part that um, uh, I'd like to give one personal one, but also um, given the responsibilities I have, I think it's important that I also say something about the institution. Um, but I should say before I begin, it is a great pleasure to, to, uh, to speak with you today. And to Krista, you should know, Krista, that my wife and I, seven o'clock, WAMU, a little shout out to the local <laughs> publication, seven o'clock on Sunday morning, we hear you. We listen to you. Um, the, the, the personal one, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking your question in the most capacious sense um, about the ability of a museum or a piece of art to transform you and take you out of place and time, which I think has its own powerfully therapeutic value. It was, uh, it was a Titian, it was the first time I'd seen a, a portrait by, uh, uh, of a, um, an 11 or 12 year old boy, he began to sit for the portrait by Titian uh, when he was 11 and when he finished he was 12. Uh, a little boy named Ranuccio Farnese who belonged to one of the great families of, of Venice. Um, uh, and he was, um, captured in the most poignant way in three colors, black and white and a kind of reddish rose by Titian um, in a way that uh, in, in almost terms that are indescribable or, or only deliverable through the, the medium of, of great, great art moved me from that place. I think, it, in fact, I saw the, the portrait in, in London um, and saw adolescence in a brand new way. I saw adolescence through the eyes of a 16th century artist. Um, and realizing in that fleet of a moment, um, not only that art can communicate things that the text cannot, but that there are certain fundamental, fundamentally shared universal experiences and that um, the, the burden of adulthood bearing on this young Renuccio Farnese, you, you could see how as his cloak fell off his shoulder, the great weight of expectation of his family, who is the grandson of the Pope, was crushing already that 12 year old boy. It really spoke. Mm -hmm. As a museum, um, a show that I visited, I was not yet then the director, I visited and which was an important moment in the history of our museum, um, was a show we did called The Art of the Quran in the fall of 2016. And uh, it, it, it brought just, um, I think it brought to the American public for the first time, um, the extraordinary quality 
of Islamic calligraphy and Quranic calligraphy in particular, and the diversity of, um, uh, uh, of that tradition. And given where we were then as a nation, and in some respects where we remain now, it was a powerful, very powerful antidote to certain um, misunderstandings of, of, of the Islamic tradition and in ways that reflect the experience that uh, Secretary Bunch described, it moved people in the galleries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you both. Krista, I know that these sort of tell me your favorite or your most important or moving questions is difficult, but I actually wanted to start there because we, nor uh, under normal circumstances, actually we would have been in this museum. And I think we all would have felt um, in different ways, obviously, what a museum space can do for us individually, and then of course, collectively. And it, I wanna start um, or continue this conversation by asking you, Krista, about some of the work that you do, which is so much about encounter. I mean, your work is really about these acts of encounter, you know, the joy and the tension of moving both toward and away from one another and the world. Um, currently, the On Being project um, is sharing digital resources that um, provide what uh, can be described as care for the exhausted. And I just, I, like, I melted when I read that. In this, I hear Lonnie's call as well for museums to do better. And I am also reminded of the 16th century uh, Hindu mystic Mirabai, whose poem says, I came for the sake of love and devotion. Then seeing the world, I wept. And I want to ask you, what have you learned from your guest about the ability of creative acts, poetry, painting, the like, to facilitate encounter and care and healing in those moments when we most want to weep? You know, one thing that, um, that I've always felt about, uh, I'm hearing a little bit of noise in that. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Um, it disturbed me when I first started my work that when religion and religious voices and ideas and spiritual voices um, get brought into public discourse and to journalism, that they're often treated like political figures. But I really feel that this part of us is more in the, it comes from the same place in us that art comes from, that creativity comes from. Um, and I, you know, what, What's on my mind, it's, it's been so, it's been really, um, it's been a lovely thing to think about what I've been, you know, what we've all been immersed in, what I've been immersed in these months, and then to bring it to this question of museums as a place in our life together. And what I think feels so important to me that we've been reintroduced to, um, that is true of both creativity and spirituality is the necessity and importance of inner life. Um, and even in, and the connection of that with meaningful action. I, I think one thing that is so clear in this period, especially with our, with our racial awakening, reckoning, and, and, and our other, our understandings that are connected with that, um, about what we value, what is essential, you know, what, what professions are valued, how we take care of each other as a society. The work ahead of us is to remake the world on so many levels and to reimagine most of our, most of our institutions. Um, and I see in new generations in particular, and I know from my life of conversation, that in order to do long haul work of reimagining and remaking, we have to plant ourselves in the inner work as well, not just in order to, to really get our intention straight, uh, which will infuse what we do over time, um, to, make, to, to, to add the reflective piece. I don't know if you heard the interview with John Lewis. I loved hearing you speak with Lonnie Bunch about him and how much internal work and really a spiritual confrontation he and, and his, and his, and his um, fellow civil rights leaders put in before they did the act mm -hmm. which went hand in hand. And, and the other piece of that, and I, I experienced younger generations kind of intuitively get that, is that 
is it that getting rested and restored contempt contemplation which is i think museums are places of contemplation and learning um that this is also a huge piece of resilience to do not just the immediate action but the long-term work mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you just as a, a, a follow up to that, um, and I did hear that conversation with John Lewis. Um, much of what he said was about sort of feeding the soul, the things that you need to do when you are, again, when you weep, when you are down. Mm -hmm. And he references music so often. Yeah. And I know a lot of the people that you interview do, and they, again, they, they reference this creative life for folks who do not see themselves as creator. Yeah. Um, as creative, um, what can we learn again? What can we learn from those conversations that you've had that um, again help us in this moment of COVID and racism and all sorts of, you know, just you know, being in the house with people you adore but who drive you crazy for right. months on end? Um, what can we take about what can we learn from what you've learned about possibility and creativity? Yeah, well, I think I think you just said feeding the soul. Did you say that? Or am I putting words in your mouth? If I didn't, I'm, I I'll take it. We have to get comfortable with that language. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think that we can all perhaps use language right now about the soul of our nation, and perhaps that being endangered. That 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 is doesn't have to be a, a doctrinal statement. Um. But yeah, I mean. I think we get to take seriously what nourishes our souls. And we can define that probably as many ways as there are people in the room. And yet I think we can have a conversation about that and all imagine something there. And, and the creative part of us or, or the creative products of humanity, art and music, um, they nurture that. They, they tend to our inner life. And, and that is as much a part of being alive. And, and if, you know, that is also a way we tend to the quality of our interactions with others, the presence we bring even to a protest, right? Or, or, or difficult situations or the pain of the world or our own grief mm -hmm. or the grief of others. So all of that, and I, I think we each, you know, also silence is important. And it's something I love about museums is they are quiet spaces in a noisy world. Mm -hmm. I interviewed this Gordon Hempton, who's a call, I think he calls himself a science, a silence activist or a science, con silence conservationist. But he said, silence is the jukebox of the soul. So there's something, and that is true of creative life. It generally needs silence. And our spiritual traditions all have a contemplative aspect. Some of them have cultivated that and made that more open uh, than others. So somehow creativity and silence and spirit and well-being, um, they are always in interplay. So Chase, this is actually a nice segue to the museum, the National Museum of Asian Art. And I think it's important. I want to thank one of our viewers who reminds us that tonight begins the Jewish holiday of mourning. Mm -hmm. And there's something, uh, a, a really profound connection to this time when we do mourn, we grieve. We, there's, a, there's much that we've, we've lost. And clearly the world that we left when Smithsonian closed its doors in March is not the one to which you will reopen your museum. Right, um, your you and your your staff will encounter a public who are calling into question old tropes and concerns and alliances. What does the National Museum of Asian Art have to say to us in this age of COVID nineteen and global efforts for racial justice? How can this space, which Krista so beautifully says is also a space of healing, and and silence, uh, and contemplation? Um, what does it have, to, what can it give us now? I think that's, um, as, as Lonnie put it, that's the challenge for all museums. Um, and I think we in the National Museum of Asian Art have a, have not just to meet that challenge, but to, um, 
to see it as an, an enormous opportunity. Um, I suppose I'd begin to answer the question by saying or, or, or uttering two, uh, two points of description of the, of the museum and the Smithsonian that are self-evident to us, but I think really are important and they overlap with the point that, that Krista made and I think that Lonnie made as well. We take for granted that our museums are free. We take for granted that they're on the National Mall. Those are both immensely important features of who we are. They're expressions of our principles, of our values, um, in, in any number of ways. What they state is that uh, museums are an integral part of the practice of democracy. They're an integral part of how we as a nation um, contemplate, to use a term that's been used, deliberate and communicate with each other. Um, there are any number of, kind of formal, even technical challenges that we face in making our museum safe and in communicating to those who choose not to come to, to, to museums or indeed speaking to global audiences. That is, of course, the, the, the role that technology can play and it's a point that, that Lonnie himself made. But I think there's an ethical or moral challenge. On the, on the one hand, I think we certainly look forward to opening our doors and providing the kind of healing experiences that people have traditionally found. Uh, the Freer Gallery especially, it's the first art museum to open in the National Mall in 1923. If one were to survey our visitors, our audience, I think the words serenity and serene would be those that appear most frequently. It's a place, it's, it's actually a, it's a gallery that in a religious sense, and I should say that today, as you both know, is uh, also marks the beginning of the pilgrimage season for Muslims, you can circumambulate our museum and feel a serenity uh, as you make your way through the galleries. But at the same time, uh, again, a point that, um, that Krista made, museums are more than just temples in which we contemplate or we worship at the altar of beauty. There are also museums in which we have to ask questions and sometimes difficult questions. Um, and uh, over the last few months, we've been reminded uh, of uh, our nation's very troubled history uh, um, when it comes to race and our nation's also troubled history and present when it comes not just to race, but also to uh, Asian societies and Asian American um, groups. And as a National Museum of Asian Art, that's obviously a challenge that we need to meet to, um, to communicate something of the extraordinary diversity, not just the diversity of the Asian cultures whose, uh, uh, whose arts we, we have the great privilege of exhibiting, but as I like to, to describe it, the individual and the collective genius of the art that we, that we exhibit. And I, and I, um, I like to say that um, uh, I, I, I defy someone to spend a half an hour with me or with a curator or with a conservator, someone who, who um, may be committed to, how should I put it, certain cultural stereotypes. I defy that person to spend a half an hour in our museum and not leave thinking differently because she or he has seen and encountered in that kind of erratic, somatic way of being in the presence of extraordinary art. I defy that person not to feel differently about Asia uh, um, and, and Asian, Asian Americans and indeed the world. So this sort of takes us, I think, more directly to ideas around healing and transformation. And, um, you know, for many of us at this moment, the digital space has become essential to the ways that we give and receive uh, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual sustenance. And some of the things that, you know, Chase, that you just said, you, you go into a museum and you have being in, in your museum and you know the ground shakes underneath you in all sorts of ways, but we can't do that now. So the digital has to help us do that. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the On Being Project, much like our colleagues at the Smithsonian's Asia Pacific American Center has created digital care packages. 
and they're filled with beautiful stories and images and voices. Um, healing is an intimate process and it's not always linear and sometimes it's plain ugly. And uh, um, I wanted to ask both of you if your ideas about the healing power of um, being together has been shifted by the fact that we cannot be. And um, what are the, how, is you, how are you thinking about your own work differently? I mean, Krista, in the, there was in the conversation that you had with the staff, at one moment you said, um, it, it was a throw, it was like, yeah, I'm used to radio, this, this like Zoom <laughs> business, I don't, it's not making any sense to me. All it's visually um, exhausting for me. <laughs> right. So again, how is it, how are you thinking about connecting through time and space in, in this format? And what, what can we learn in, in terms of our museum practice from what you're learning? Yeah, I, I feel like we are on this massive learning curve all at the same time. Um, um, and so, so, so I'm having, I'm having contradictory experiences. experiences. Um, on the one hand, one of the things I started observing in the early days of Zoom was that I would feel so exhausted at the end of meetings. And I felt, and I became aware that when we're in the room together with other people, I think at an animal level, we are picking up energy from each other. You know, even if it's a difficult meeting, it, 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 there's, a, there's a two way thing that's going on. And, um, and with Zoom, it, sometimes, you know, I just leave exhausted because I've just directed myself at the screen, but you don't get that, that thing back. And at the same time, you know, I'm having experiences like this that actually feel intimate and they feel meaningful and they feel nourishing. And I've, I've always been somebody who said that, that the internet is just a new canvas for the old human condition and all of our good, bad and ugly is magnified and on display. And so I'm kind of, I think one of the interesting like, frontiers we're on now is like you can humanize these technologies and you know I think we're learn we're all learning we're getting new best practices and we're also getting new bad experiences <laughs> that's very true and Chase to that point I mean, you know you can humanize the experience but can you curate healing and transformation uh, online or actually even in a gallery I mean you you pay such deep attention to the objects but as a, as a scholar, as a curator, as uh, you work with incredible curators, how do you approach facilitating that connection that we all seek when we go into a museum? The honest answer, uh, Sabrina, is it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. I think uh, we've all learned an enormous amount in the last four or five months. Um, and I think, um, when the history of how technology was married to, um, to museums and exhibitions is written in three, four, five, six, seven years, this moment will be crucial. It might be a watershed. Um, one of the lessons is I think you don't try to capture the physical experience simply by putting it, um, uh, making it available digitally. And, 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 and you need to think about um, uh, the, the, the works of art, the pieces of art, the stories you want to tell, the lessons you'd like to teach, the experience you'd want to have um, from the digital perspective at the start. So um, we've begun to experiment um, and ask me that question in six or 12 or 18 months and I'll give you two or three examples. There, one thing is already clear. Um, um, Several Smithsonian museums attract millions of, of visitors a year. We attract a, a smaller number, but still hundreds of thousands, five, six, seven hundred thousand visitors a year. Um, that's a tiny number. That's a tiny number in a in a in a, in a country in a country of three hundred and thirty million. Mm -hmm. So the scale, um, uh, the opportunities for scale and engagement are extraordinary. Let me give you one example. For years, we've been doing meditation, mindfulness and, medica and, 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 and meditation in our auditorium. We, um, we typically have 20 or 30 or 40 people who would come and it was a valued part of their day to center themselves at noon, to come to a museum, the quiet space, and, and, and to do some meditation. 
We now have meditation virtually every day online with hundreds of people, sometimes even more participating. What did that tell me? It told me there's a huge hunger and that people saw in the museum, shall we say a kind of responsible provider, but at the same time, it taught me and it taught my colleagues that if one gets the experience right, you can have an impact, which is well beyond the numbers who actually can, can experience something physically. So having said that I'm deeply committed as I'm sure we all are to the physical, to that tactile, to the somatic, at the same time, I think it opens up frontiers for us to reach those who, for reasons entirely unrelated to COVID-19, just to geography, to distance, who otherwise they wouldn't feel um, the impact that we can that we can bring. We have a few um, questions from the audience that kind of link to what you've just said, Chase, and they're very sort of museum-y questions. People are very interested and concerned for the health and well-being of your museum, and someone has asked. Um, they've said last week the American Alliance of Museums reported that a third of museums may close by the by years in. Um, what can people who love museums do to help preserve these temples of art and serenity and contemplation? Um, I know it's something that you and probably many of your director colleagues have been thinking about, but what can the public do to ensure that places, not just the Smithsonian, but you know the, the House Museum around the corner um, continue to be a part of their lives? I think people can do many things. One is they can come. Um, obviously, they, they, they need to feel safe and they need to feel secure. Um, but it's extraordinary how resourceful and ingenious and creative museums are being in allowing people in curating experiences that are safe and powerful. So they need to come. They need to vote with their feet. Mm. I think it's just as important that they need to advocate. They really need to advocate in the way that Krista advocates uh, for um, the, the benefit, the virtue even that comes with reflecting, that comes with communication, that comes with respect. They need to advocate uh, for, uh, for museums as, uh, as integral parts of democratic process, as I put it, but also as that um, that space that that um, that can generate um, the healing, the collective experience. Um, to use an old-fashioned word, even the fellowship that comes with beholding terrific pieces uh, of art. Um, and I think um, uh, I don't think I'm saying anything controversial when I suggest that we as a nation underinvest. In, in cultural institutions. Um, so it's, it's an important, uh, uh, museums are an immensely important link, not just in uh, what might be called the, the nation's educational infrastructure, but in its psychological well being and its health in that larger sense. So that actually connects to um, something again that came up in the really, again, I keep hearkening back to this beautiful conversation yesterday with the staff and Krista um, and um, Deborah Diamond, who is your colleague at the museum. So beautifully moderated it. Um, but Krista, at some point mm -hmm. you raised the issue of beauty and um, it is definitely the stuff of museums. And you touch upon it in your book, The Coming Wise, an inquiry into the mystery and art of living. And I have to admit that I, there's a question here that I'm not sure what it is. And, and I will tell you it's because we are not living in the most beautiful of times. And I cherish the idea of beauty, but I am not comfortable with it at this moment. And I, I'm thinking of Ra, uh, someone you know, Lama, Rod Owens, who talks about heartbrokenness. And he again connects it to this mm -hmm. sort of disembodied expression of a severe disappointment that longs to be cared for. It, intellectually, I know beauty can do that. Um, and so in my question, non-question, Krista, and I wanna ask Chase the same thing, can you talk to us about 
beauty, what it means to you, and how we can tap into it when we don't feel like it. <laughs> that's not the thing that's calling us, but that is certainly the thing, the wonderful thing that we find in museums. Yeah. There's so much that we're talking about that the present has confronted us with, which is really countercultural because we're very either or oriented and we're very action oriented and productivity oriented. And I feel about beauty like I feel about silence, like I feel about joy, that these are not, and this is countercultural for Americans, these are not optional and they're not self-indulgent they are companions to being fully present also to what is hard and difficult you know um some of the i i, I and i think you know beauty i i shared with you all yesterday my some of my favorite ways to think about beauty. You know, in Islam, there's a tradition of beauty as a core moral value. And there's this, my kind of working definition of beauty is from John O'Donohue, which is that in the presence of which we feel more alive. And even as I'm having conversations now with activists, I think those who are wise understand that in order to be fully present for if we're if we're doing if we're at the bending the long arc of the moral universe now as much as we're about rectifying what needs to be rectified today and tomorrow um, it is an ability and an insistence on being fierce about also what brings joy you know being fierce as john lewis was about what you love as much as what you hate as fierce about what is beautiful and brings you alive because that is what helps carry you through what must be overcome. And, that, and that's not to say that you feel it every day, right? That's why we actually need each other. Mm -hmm. These mm -hmm. virtues, all the virtues and a virtue of, of being present to beauty and insisting on joy, even in the midst of everything else, is, um, we, and all of us can't carry it on any given day, but this is also a way we have to accompany each other moving forward. Mm -hmm. Somebody can carry it for you on another day. Yeah. Chase, talk to us about beauty in the museum. That's arguably, um, the kind of animating question of, of our museum's foundation. Um, our collection initially consisted of the personal collection of, of Charles Lang Freer, who um, was a collector and industrialist who um, was an autodidact, left school at a young age, um, made a fortune, and then threw himself into decades of collecting and developed an extraordinary eye and had um, some very strong ideas of, of beauty. And in fact, had a theory of beauty in which it was universal, in which American art of this period reflected underlying conceptions of beauty in tone and hue and color with Asian uh, art historical traditions. Um, I think this is one of these words that we um, in the 21st century um, do well by parsing. I think in popular usage, uh, beautiful is reduced to pretty. <laughs> um, and I, I think Krista was intimating this herself. It, it's, a, it, it's a much broader uh, term than, than pretty. Um, when I think about beauty in, our, in the terms of, of our galleries and, and, and the art that we exhibit, it's transfixing, it's compelling, it's consuming, it has affect. Um, it's not necessarily pretty, but it's engrossing. Um, so, um, you know, why is it that uh, museums have been in um, secularizing, if not secularized, but secularizing societies of 
in, in Western Europe and North America, in America in particular, in the 19th and 20th centuries? Why have they taken over? Um, uh, why have they dislodged religious institutions as the as as um, the um, um, sites of some authority? It's precisely because they're conjuring, they're producing those same affects that in the pre-modern and early modern period, religious institutions, cathedrals, um, the most obvious example, mosques, extraordinary illustrated manuscripts, uh, divination bowls, any number of examples that we could be, could be drawn from our, uh, our collection. Those were in many, many respects uh, produced by or for a religious context. And, and, and as society has changed, museums have taken on this authority. So I think we need to do a better job as museums in defining beauty and kind of working out just how capacious the, 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 the word actually is. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Um, there are a couple comments from our viewers that I wanted to reference. One um, who, uh, from someone who is a museum, uh, uh, let's see, a therapeutic museum musician playing for people who are seriously ill and at the end of life. And he talks about, or she talks about the big part of his job is to remind people that there is still beauty very until the end, which is really quite astounding. And uh, then someone else has, has said um, about the importance of decolonizing beauty um, and expanding definitions of what we deem beautiful and worthy of a museum's attention and care. And, and Chase speaks to what you've just said, sort of opening up that definition, um, asking us together to reimagine what beauty is and does and how it feeds us. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for the question, and I think it, um, one doesn't have to take my word for it or a museum director's or a curator's word for it. Um, go to a museum and witness the effect of great art upon those who suffer Alzheimer's or children who have learning uh, difficulties and watch the response, watch the interaction, watch uh, what happens. It's, it's nothing short of magical. And, 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 and it's a demonstration of, of, of the power of that engagement and the therapeutic effect of that engagement as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We are, of course, almost out of time and I have about 170,000 questions that I'd love to ask you both. Um, Krista, as our guest, um, I want to give you the last word. Um, I'm wondering if there were things that you heard from um, the staff, the wonderful staff at this museum that surprised you. The, were there questions that they asked you that you thought, oh, this is the work of museums? Um, and if you could share some of that with us. I, I, I found it, it's been fascinating for me to learn and not surprising, but to understand how you, you have had your own version of a struggle that we have had culturally, which is not just how to talk about religion and spirituality in public places. It's how to talk about this part of ourselves and these traditions, all of which have extraordinary aesthetic, artistic lineages and, you know, creations. Um, they, they are, they are you, you know, one way you can look at them is that they are the places in culture where this part of us, this part of the human enterprise has been delved into, you know, found creative as well as intellectual expression, as well as communal expression, where we've honored the part of ourselves that needs ritual, that needs contemplation. Um, and I, so, and, and, and what, I, what I've enjoyed about experiencing that through your experience is that it's dovetailed with what I'm seeing in the culture right now. Since, you know, the, and the, what, one of the things I think the pandemic the pandemic, I mean, there's, I'm sure we will be analyzing for years the year 2020 
and how everything came together. And I, but I think one thing that happened is that we, we civilizationally had this collective experience that the ground beneath our feet is not as solid as we imagined it to be, which is a basic truth. It is a basic, basic spiritual truth. And a lot of spiritual inquiry and practice is about befriending that reality. Um, so we had that experience. And I think, it, to put it very simply, our defenses were down including the defenses we have over against each other and our self-understanding. And I don't, you know, what happened to George Floyd in my city of Minneapolis was not new, but we were able, we collectively, culturally, there was a seeing and a taking in. And, and I think that that, there's a there are political implications to that there are economic you know all they're going to be all these reckonings but it it was a it, it it touches us spiritually in the most expansive profound meaning of that our very understanding of what it means to be human and who we will be to each other and therefore what kind of society we create um and i think that there's been an opening in this period and i hear it it converging with this wonderful discernment about what is the role of a museum and what are these spaces in our life together and what role, what new role might they play that we're opening to this part of the human experience. Uh, we're, we're reaching for new words about it. We're reaching for experiences. We're reaching to honor the sides of ourselves that need beauty and joy and mm. And also, I feel like one thing I keep thinking as we're speaking is we have to, you know, if you could, one of the key challenges here is that we, we is seeing differently, seeing better, refining the art of seeing. And I think that is actually one thing that museums offer, this experience of concentrated seeing and observing and presence and letting that soak into you. You know, and I, I, it's been such a wonderful thing to be part of this conversation because I haven't actually heard people talking about this much in public, this aspect of this moment. It's a, it's a beautiful thing. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you for your time and for, again, your generosity, for being here with us um, lots of comments and questions from our audience, um, more than we could possibly get through in, in a week or a month. Um, but I want to encourage our, our viewers to continue engaging with each other in online. Um, and again, I want to thank you just for being so open to this conversation. Um, I also, again, want to thank our viewers for participating by watching and listening and commenting. Um, I know that you are leaving with many more questions than answers. And I think that that means that we've done our job well. I invite you to explore the museum's digital resources and events, um, and particularly check out those of the On Being Project, and of course, the Smithsonian Folklife Festival's Digital Story Circles, which you'll find at festival.si.edu. I have to put in the plug for my festival. Um, most importantly, I encourage you to continue this conversation with your family and your friends and your communities. Um, we're going to close with the last word from Secretary Bunch. But before we do that, I'd like to thank Lizzie Stein, Grace Murray, and Sana Mirza for their incredible work on this series of programs. I also want to thank my Folklife Festival cherished co colleagues, Albert Tong, Sarah Rothman, Elisa Huff for their video production and the Smithsonian's audio visual branch for making this all possible. Of course, we all thank the Lilly Foundation for their support of Smithsonian efforts to understand the role of religion in American life. Those of us at the Smithsonian look forward to the day when we can welcome you back to our galleries and our programs. And I will, of course, issue yet another invitation to Krista to come back and join us. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to share time and thoughts and care with one another. 
Until then, I will leave you with a few words from Dr. Bunch um, to you all. Be well. When it comes to the role of museums in advocating for change, um, particularly a publicly funded museum, You've been quite clear about where the Smithsonian should stand and what it should be, what it should do. Tell us a little bit about your thinking on mm -hmm. um, this. And you know, this is a moment where you could say uh, you could shy away, um, and you have chosen to be bold. Um, talk us through your thinking. You know, I don't know if I'm bold. What I want to do is help a country be made better, mm -hmm. and if that means that we have to take some risk. If that means we have to illuminate all the dark corners so that we can find hope and understanding, then I'm for that. I think that one of the things I learned in building the National Museum of African American History and Culture is, you know, you have to also be political. You have to think smart and creative, build allies, make sure that people understand why you're doing it. Yes, you're going to be criticized. But ultimately, as somebody once said to me, I was asked, you know, um, why did I do a particular act? And I said, because I have a political agenda. The agenda mm. is to make a country better. Mm. And if something's wrong with that agenda, then something's wrong in the country. Um, mm. I believe very strongly that it is not a desire to cause controversy for controversy's sake. It's not a desire to upset the right or the left. What the desire is, is that the Smithsonian is one of those few places where you can actually bring people of different points of view together. Mm. It's one of those few places that people trust. And I never want to abuse that trust, but you want to use that trust. If we are an educational entity, and that's what I believe we are first and foremost, if we're an educational entity, then use our resources, use our expertise, use our passion to help people find understanding. Um, that doesn't mean that we're not going to always have people who are criticizing us for doing this or doing that. But the one thing I've learned in my career, I'm going to be criticized anyway, so I might as well do the good work. Mm -hmm. do the best work I can and accept the criticism from that point of view.